If you're thinking about buying a plug-in hybrid EV, a so-called FEV, whether this is a good idea or not depends mainly on you and exactly why you are motivated to buy it. In this report, we're going to look at the objectively good reasons to buy a plug-in as well as the objectively bad ones. Do not hand over that pig fat stack of cash without watching this report first. I'm Phil Logan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. <laughs> Australia only. <coughs> Seriously. Website. Card. Perhaps it's because Mitsubishi just launched the Outlander plug-in hybrid EV, but my inbox is currently awash with inquiries that go something like this. With the price of petrol so astronomical, I'm thinking about buying a plug-in because I'm not yet ready for the jump to a full EV, but I want to start saving money on fuel. Another class of inquiry is, I feel like I need to buy a plug-in because if I buy a conventional internal combustion car, it's going to be worthless in the future, or it might be, when I trade it in because of the imminent transition of the vehicle fleet to, you know, electric this and that. And I'll be saving money on fuel. <laughs> We're going to deep dive into that in just a sec. This video is supported by Olight. I carry one of these every day, which is why I have no hesitation recommending it to you. It's this, the Warrior Mini 2. It's a great flashlight. Look, look at how bright that is. They're quite tough too. I'll just whip it on and give it its thrice daily durability test. Bear with me. Certainly more than adequate to the slings and arrows of fat cave operation. Frankly, you know, these are the best torches I have ever used. And that means if you're scratching around for a Father's Day gift and there are no rules of which I am aware which preclude you from buying a gift for yourself, if you're a dad, then I think we found a winner. There's an Olight sale today. It's Wednesday the 17th of August as I record this and it goes until Friday the 19th. I'll put a link with full details in the description. The new Arkfeld 1000 Lumen EDC torch. Now, I wasn't so sure about the rectangular cross section of this baby, but it's okay in the hand, right? It fits there just fine and it is super slim in the pocket and bezel down clip too, so it deploys the right way up every time, which is kind of important if you need it in a hurry. The Arcfield has a magnetic base that's also the attachment for the USB charger. In fact, all of these Olights recharge exactly the same way. Plus, there are five brightness levels. It's IPX7 waterproof, and it's even got this pretty cool green laser pointer thing of a, you know, vital PowerPoint emphasis and tormenting the neighbor's cat. That's not a real suggestion. Do it. And it's well under a hundred bucks during the sale. So there's that. Next is the Warrior Mini 2, which is my favorite Olight of all time in this limited edition disco camouflage color. It's the sweet spot between EDC and tactical torches, at least in my mind. EDC because it's small and light and pocket sized and tactical because it's got this thumb switch on the back that you can always get to and it's super bright at 1750 lumens and you could beat a zombie to death with it if necessary except that they're already dead obviously so that's a paradox now look finally if you just read the entrails or something and they're predicting a full-on zombie apocalypse in the near future led perhaps by Dut, truly horrifying stuff in other words, then upgrade to the Warrior X3 Max. This thing is a two and a half thousand lumen powerhouse, like virtually a lightsaber. It's the full-on tactical option, which you could shove in a pocket if needs must, but it's going to be far more comfortable on a duty belt, in a pouch, etc., in a backpack, whatever. You versus a horde of undead vermin bad for the vermin 
And there's a glass breaking bezel on the front with these three super hard zirconium beads against which a tempered car window stands absolutely no chance. Just remember not to hit it dead centre, dude. Look for a 90 degree corner up where the roof line meets the pillar, okay? That's where the residual stresses from tempering the glass are at their most unbalanced. Every window on every car is just kind of gagging to break right in that corner. Pro tip. So look after your dad or, you know, a dad or even you if you're a dad between now and the 19th. Links in the description and thanks once again to Olight for sponsoring this unbelievably excellent, if somewhat highbrow, YouTube report. Right now, fuel is expensive, relatively expensive. With a plug-in, you might drive to work and the shops, just like an EV and charge at home, and only buy liquid fuel for long trips. This could be your thought process. And this might seem like a no-brainer, right? The proposition is, I'm buying a plug-in hybrid to start saving money on fuel. <laughs> To which I would retort, bad idea, dude. Objectively bad, indefensible, complete fantasy. Here's why. Taking the new Outlander plug-in as an example, the internal combustion one, the Exceed Tourer internal combustion only Outlander, is 57,000 bucks drive away in New South Wales. The same thing, but plug-in, is 74,000 bucks. It's $17,000 more for the plug-in. And I'm not saying this is a rip-off. There is a dirty big battery down there. That's huge. Plus an inverter, there's control architecture, an electric motor generator unit, and none of this hardware is especially cheap. You have to pay for it. But let's look at the argument and let's give it the best chance of success, okay? Let's say you have rooftop solar. So electricity for you is quote unquote free. And the car is at home when the sun is shining for recharging. And you always plug it in. And let's say you only ever drive it in EV mode. Now, I cannot be kinder to this argument than that. But I suggest we are basically off in la la land here because you did actually pay for the solar, it's not free, and in practice it is very difficult to operate plug-ins only in EV mode, even the Outlander with its official 84 kilometres of EV only range, which is quite impressive. I'm just trying to be overly generous to team saving money on fuel, okay? If you do this, you will sidestep burning 8.1 litres of fuel per 100 kilometres, which is officially the internal combustion outlander fuel consumption. That's the combined cycle test, which means it's probably more like 10.5 for the urban part. Actually, if memory serves, it is exactly 10.5 for the urban part with that vehicle. And even that's not especially realistic. So let's say, for argument's sake, it's actually going to be drinking about 12.5 litres per 100 out there in service on urban roads with you driving, if you went that way. If petrol's two bucks a litre, that's 25 bucks for every 100 k's, 250 bucks for 1,000 k's worth of money saved if you buy the plug-in and operate it as discussed, only in EV mode with free electricity. Every 4,000 k's is gonna be a thousand bucks that you save, and you have to save 17 grand to break even, okay? So you need to drive at least, very best case scenario, 68,000 k's in EV only mode to break even. Post-COVID, that's going to be six or seven years of driving from many people, at least. Maybe not everyone, but certainly many people drive less today than they did before the pandemic. That's to break even. You have not saved one cent at this point. You're about to start saving money, dude. This is the best case scenario for breaking even. For many people, it's going to take 
substantially longer. Most new car buyers don't even own their cars for that long. Three to five years is far more common. So the average new plug-in buyer is never going to break even. You are never going to save money on fuel. The second major point here about plug-ins is this general fantasy people have about EV-only driving and how accessible that is. Manufacturers are going to put the EV-only range right up there in lights. For example, the BMW X3 xDrive 30e, the plug-in one, what a mouthful, it's got a 12 kilowatt hour battery that's good for 41 k's of official EV mode range. What they don't say quite so obviously, and this is all manufacturers, not just the Bavarians, is that the maximum power output of the electrical side of the vehicle is limited, in this case, to 80 kilowatts. Total combined power of the platform is 215, including the combustion engine. So, if you're driving along in EV mode and you need to go up a really, really steep hill or overtake a truck or accelerate moderately, and your demand for power exceeds the electrical system's maximum 80 kilowatts, what do you think's going to happen? The internal combustion engine must activate to give you what you just requested. So this fantasy about plug-ins offering you the first however many Ks of driving in EV-only mode and only then switching to combustion, that is comprehensive bullshit, dude, unless you operate under the caveats of driving really gently below the threshold which demands combustion engine activation and also setting off every day with a fully charged battery. Speaking of which, if you're not prepared to plug in kind of religiously, only without the belief in all those fairies, then owning a plug-in is going to be a complete waste of time for you. See, Obviously, the EV-only driving aspiration is only possible on a fully charged battery. If you let the battery become depleted, the car is still going to drive okay using combustion. It'll even regeneratively brake like a non-plug-in hybrid. But you are going to be carrying around a dirty, big, heavy battery, a motor and an inverter system that achieves very little in these circumstances beyond merely being excess baggage. And dude, before you kick off in the comments, with various takes on, oh, that's ridiculous, mate, who would do such a stupid thing? The answer is plenty of people. In fact... In this 2022 report from the International Council on Clean Transportation in Europe, they found that the actual consumption of plug-in hybrids on the road in Europe was three to five times higher than the regulatory claims. And this is not a manufacturer's cheating scenario. It's generally just down to how the people who own those cars or who drive them actually use them. See, privately owned plug-ins were found to be three times higher than the official numbers and company cars an incredible five times higher. This is generally a consequence of them not being fully charged before being driven. Humanity always invents a better idiot, upliftingly, it seems. You can certainly count on that. Some significant wedge of society it just can't be asked to plug in, okay? Of course, if that's you and you bought the car to start saving money on fuel, then the break-even period we discussed earlier is no longer going to be 68,000 Ks. It's going to be longer than the life of the vehicle. Okay, so right about now, I know that this report is sounding like a comprehensive hit piece on plug-in hybrids, but I assure you it is not. It is a reality check. Facts are facts, dude, and you don't even have to like them. They're still facts. However, I'd suggest there are quite a few good reasons for you to own a plug-in hybrid. 
If you do mainly urban commuting and you are prepared to plug in most days and operate your plug-in with a fully charged battery and drive gently to work or school or the shops, whatever, then you are going to be operating in EV mode often enough. The real advantage of this, as I see it, is that you will contribute no tailpipe pollution to the air which we breathe. I'm not talking about CO2 so much here. I'm talking about carcinogens and other nasties like NOx and carbon monoxide. Tailpipe pollution actually kills more people prematurely than car crashes. This is also a fact and it is rather a big deal in cities around the world. Also, with a plug-in, you get access to EV-like transportation often enough without the far heftier purchase price of a full EV. And if you do occasional long-distance driving, you can achieve that easily without military-grade logistics planning, which you actually do need to do in an EV, given Australia's breathtakingly crap charging infrastructure especially out there in the regions. You don't have to go too far away from a city for this to be a big problem. Driving a full EV between capital cities here is a proper pain in the ass. Driving a plug-in is not. It'll run just like a normal car for just as long as you manage to keep tipping liquid fuel into it. One fairly exciting development with plug-ins is exemplified in the new Outlander that vehicle has a 240 volt AC supply, so you can plug a conventional extension cord into it and siphon off mains type electricity. And you can do this out in the boonies camping, but more importantly, you might be able to keep appliances and lights on at home in the event of a power failure. And power failures have kind of been in the news rather a lot lately. There are limits to how much power can be supplied, obviously, but 20 kilowatt hours is a lot of energy, power and energy being different things. So your vehicle could conceivably be a multi-day home power failure backup system. And you could certainly offset part of the price premium against the cost of buying a completely separate power failure backup system for your home. I recently looked at the Bluetti AC300 and B300 modular home battery backup system. I'll put a link up there if my age addled brain can remember to do so. That unit is three kilowatt hours of energy and three kilowatts of power and it costs about $5,700 currently. So that's a way to put the price premium of the Outlander plug-in in perspective. The final decent objective reason for owning a plug-in is one that really doesn't get as much oxygen as it should, and that would be national energy security. We are quite vulnerable nationally in Australia to disruption of the international liquid fuel supply chain. Now just take a look at what mad bad Vlad and his Ukraine tantrum has managed to do to the price of fuel here more than half the world away. And that's only a minor disruption for fuel, obviously. It's kind of a huge problem if you're in Ukraine right now. Imagine what a full-on global geopolitical shitstorm would do for fuel here. I'm seeing queues over the horizon and empty shelves in the supermarkets, the kind of thing from which only Tom Cruise and Mila Jovovich might save the world, you can help reduce our national dependency on foreign oil, albeit only infinitesimally, each by buying a vehicle that's less dependent on liquid fuels. Plug-ins make complete sense here. I hope this helps put the plug-in thing in perspective for you because it is rather a lot of money on the table. Thank you very much for watching.